everyone, thanks for joining us again. I hope you're enjoying some of the easing of restrictions in the various parts of the country. Although we've still got borders closed and it's far from back to normal. Um, so we're still continuing these weekly webinars. Today we've got a really great one. So I'm going to do a brief introduction and then hand you over to Marcus. <laughs> um, so obviously this is ITS Australia, um, it's part of our webinar series. Um, one we're doing in partnership with NTC, part of their consultation on the automated vehicle regulation work that they've been doing. Um, and obviously ITS Australia is a member-based organisation supporting industry, the transport technology space. So um, the slide up next, Marcus, will show all of the members that we have currently. And I know I can see a lot of the names of people that are joining us right now and have signed on to the webinar uh, are members. And if you're not, get in contact. Um, either way, get in contact. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff to talk about, even while we're still going through this sort of shocking current situation. Um, so I'm going to let these guys talk because they've got a lot to go through and we've only got an hour. Um, Marcus, why don't you take it away? Great, thanks very much Stacey and, and thanks to Stacey and ITS Australia for organising the, the webinar today um, and also to the other speakers for giving their time. I think it's a really great panel to discuss the issues and I'm, I'm looking forward to your, your questions and the discussion. Uh, each of the panel members is going to give some introductory thoughts for about five minutes each, and then we'll have some discussion and, and a chance for the audience to, to ask questions. So, so please put your, your questions into the, uh, into the comments. Uh, it's a very interesting topic today of the future use of vehicle generated data. Uh, everyone loves data. Everyone loves talking about the, the potential and the opportunities for data in the future but there is a range of practicalities that we actually need to work through um, to actually gain the, the benefits. And we need to understand the perspectives of manufacturers, of, of drivers, um, as well as of road agencies. So the National Transport Commission has begun a review of future opportunities for vehicle generated data. Uh, the purpose of this is to develop policy options for government access and use of vehicle generated data for the purposes of network operations, investment, maintenance, planning and road safety. So transport ministers have, have asked us to undertake this work uh, to look at what these potential opportunities might be. So can we use vehicle data to improve network efficiency and, and reduce congestion? Are there opportunities for vehicles to signal when they've broken down in order to uh, warn other road users or to let a road manager know that they need to, to clear something or, or to manage the traffic around that site? Um, are there ways that we can have uh, sensors on vehicles indicate maintenance issues on the roadway so that we can actually address those more efficiency, more efficiently? So all, all of these are opportunities for the future, uh, but there's a lot of work to do to actually realise those. So we've got a, a discussion paper that's currently out for public consultation until the 3rd of July. Um, so we'd love for, for people on the, the call to, to have a look at that and provide us with your feedback either formally through a submission or, or get in contact with us in uh, uh, more informally. Uh, and coming out of that, we are planning to make recommendations to transport ministers in November of this year. And you can see a link there to the, the discussion paper. So what do we mean when we're actually talking about vehicle generated data? What we're seeing, and, and some of the other speakers will, will touch on this, is that there's more and more sensors being added to vehicles and more and more data being uh, collected by those vehicles. But it is up to four terabytes a day, which as uh, those who deal with data will tell you is, is a lot um, and much more than could ever be actually collected by the vehicle efficiently or, or transmitted to others. Um, so we need to look at what's actually needed uh, to help some of these uh, opportunities that we've talked about. So we've defined vehicle generated data as any data generated by the vehicle itself that is about the vehicle, the road environment or the use of the vehicle. And so we, we need to uh, think about what's different about uh, this compared to other data sources that might be available. But in order to, to get to the, the opportunities that we've talked about, there's a range of different uh, challenges or problems that we've got to work through. So vehicle generated data is not currently uh, provided uh, to road agencies um, for these kind of purposes. Um, currently, we don't have a data access framework to actually provide the necessary trust of the data exchange systems, uh, the standards that would underpin all of this. Uh, and so all of those elements would need to be developed uh, in order to, to uh, gain the benefits of, uh, of this sort of data. And finally, we see that at the moment, the level of 
uptake and uh, and use of connectivity across the Australian vehicle fleet is, is quite low. Um, so that may delay the, the benefits of, uh, of, of gaining this data uh, if that, that penetration of the fleet continues to be low. So there's a range of different challenges that we would, we would need to work through. But as part of looking at this, we also should look at what models are actually being developed overseas. And so in particular, we're looking at the European Union uh, and the, the task force, the data task force that has been set up, uh, which is looking at a series of use cases um, to allow the automotive industry and governments to exchange data in order to benefit drivers uh, and also to, uh, to, to benefit uh, the, the, the public. Uh, so that's just a very brief introduction to uh, the issues um, and some of the challenges that we're looking at in our discussion paper. Uh, and with that, I will hand over to Ben Wilson. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ben Wilson. I'm a Senior Product Manager for Connected Vehicle Services uh, for AsiaPAC. Um, I work within the Global Product Management Team for HERE Organisation. Um, HERE Organisation uh, is a traditional provider of mapping data to the automotive industry. Um, we've been around since the 80s and uh, worked on such things as the, uh, some of the early navigation systems. Um, and we've been working in that area ever since. Um, in 2015, uh, here it was sold by Nokia Corporation to a, to a consortium of uh, automotive companies, including Daimler, Aldi, um, BMW, uh, Continental, uh, Bosch, and also Intel have interests in the organisation. So we've been working closely um, with the automotive industry. Uh, and working in this space about how to uh, use uh, vehicle generated data. So if we go to the next slide, Marcus. Um, we just probably want to start off by having a bit of a look at the data that's actually being collected out of the vehicles. And I think um, you saw some information there from Marcus and I think Ben will talk um, a little bit more about this. But we've, um, in, in Europe, we've already commercialised some of these products working with our partners. Uh, and the type of things that we've actually been able to do is just using um, you know, the readily available information that's being collected out of the vehicle. So obviously we have GPS data that's available, but there's also a lot of other behaviours that occur within the vehicle, such as you know, hazard lights during uh, an accident, um, heavy brake pressure, ABS deployments, uh, even information about parking and availability of parking information, and video cameras. So if we go to the next slide, I might just have a quick um, overview of some of the, the products that are commercially available today um, in Europe and North America and things that we'll um, certainly uh, consider releasing into the local market uh, when we have um, the volume of content available. So you would all be quite uh, familiar with here time or here real-time traffic services. Um, these have been in the market for some time now and we use a lot of the GPS data that we collect from vehicles to give us an understanding of um, what's occurring on the roads at any given time. So we process that information, that GPS data, uh, and then we uh, broadcast that in you know, IP solutions um, available to, to the automotive companies. Some of the more forward-looking type products that we're looking at the moment are things like here hazard warnings. Um, this uses potentially incidents that are occurring on the roads, and we're using the sensor data from the vehicle to inform us about what's actually occurring. So that might be a harsh braking uh, alert, or it might be um, hazard warning lights when we have a broken down vehicle. So with this information, um, we can bring together some of the various different sensor information within the vehicle, and that can provide an alert to us. The information is processed in the vehicle, and then the alert is sent di uh, directly to us via the cloud, um, so that we can uh, process that information and, and broadcast it. Another good example is um, here road signs. This actually uses the video camera data, which is being processed uh, in the vehicle to for uh, road sign recognition. And we can process that within the vehicle, um, compare road signs that are being seen on the road by the video camera uh, to what's actually being published in the map that's uh, working within the vehicle. And then where the vehicle sees that there's a difference between what's published in the map um, and what it's seen from the video camera, an alert can be sent to us. And that, that helps us to keep our map fresh so that we understand exactly any changes that are occurring on the road network. So these are all good examples of how this data is actually being commercialised today um, in, in Europe and North America and things that we'll start to see rolling out in Australia in the near future. So uh, now I'll hand over to uh, Ben from Toyota. 
Thank you, Ben Wilson. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Finkelstein. I uh, work um, within the New Business Solutions Division of Toyota Motor Corporation Australia. Specifically, I look at um, Toyota's uh, connected vehicle, um, vehicle data generation strategy, um, as well um, as our data privacy policies and positions. Uh, if we move on to the next slide, Marcus, just a, a, a few remarks and comments that I'd need to make um, just to set um, the expectations that this is exclusively Toyota of Australia's interpretation. Um, I'm, I'm not here to represent um, and, and speak on behalf of the FCAI. Um, it's not necessarily reflective of Toyota's global position um, and the information provided is general in nature for the purposes of this webinar. So hoping to use the next few minutes just to, um, I guess, provide some context um, on vehicle generated data, some of the platforms and solutions, um, and then um, finally discuss some of the challenges that OEMs um, will face here in Australia to bring these uh, solutions to market um, and when we start talking about sharing of, of vehicle data. Uh, next slide, please, Marcus. So Toyota Australia, um, we, we have a vision uh, where we, we are looking now to create innovative mobility solutions for all Australians. Um, underpinning this vision, um, we've looked at um, the potential vehicle data that's going to come from the vehicle, which will underpin a lot of these mobility platforms that will help drive these products and solutions um, to our guests, to our customers. So it's imperative um, that we, we um, invest in these platforms, invest in these solutions, um, as well as work with um, stakeholders within the industry like Ben Wilson, who as a data aggregator and, and Marcus from the NTC, um, when we start talking about um, future use cases of vehicle generated data for the sake of societal and community benefits. Uh, next slide, please, Marcus. So uh, if we look at connected vehicle data, um, traditionally or currently, we see that uh, there is uh, connectivity um, amongst vehicles, traditionally through the multimedia system via the mobile phone or a handset. Uh, we're starting to see now, uh, whether it's um, <clears throat> through an aftermarket or a genuine solution, these plug-in onboard diagnostic uh, devices or dongles that are creating uh, car connectivity with a limited data set. Um, and what we are now um, starting to, to see across the Australian marketplace, which has flown in from Japan, Europe, uh, and North America are these embedded uh, devices um, or um, that act as a modem to start uh, taking uh, information that's traditionally sat within the vehicle um, across um, to, to the providers. Marcus, just on the, the next. Uh, underpinning uh, the connectivity, uh, OEMs have to look at the back end infrastructure to support um, the sharing of that data onto um, an offboard system. Um, so there's obviously um, a lot of work mm -hmm. and investment done on um, data protection and transfer across through to a data storage system and then have the ability to access that remotely to uh, provide uh, core features to their customers. And if we just click through, Marcus, um, what we're seeing is some of the uh, overall opportunities um, of these core features um, sit within three main areas of, of safety, security, and vehicle servicing. Um, these are opportunities that are, are prevalent in the North American and the European markets. Um, and in the, in the um, future, we'll see these types of opportunities flow through to uh, the Australian marketplace once we see the increase of saturation of connected vehicles within Australia. Marcus, we'll move on, please. Uh, I wanted to highlight some of the challenges for OEMs um, in this space. Um, I know that there's, there'll be some further discussions about this later, but the four main areas um, of, of challenge uh, for all OEMs, uh, firstly, is the availability of data. So um, vehicle generated data is obviously reliant on the vehicle being connected. 
Uh, if we look at the Australian marketplace, currently there's less than 1% of new vehicles that have um, connectivity. Um, as vehicles um, or vehicle ranges roll out, there's obviously going to be a period of time um, in which we will see increased um, number of connected vehicles. Um, network coverage uh, also plays a part in availability of data as well as data retention. Um, there's a, a significant cost and we'll get to costs in holding that data, um, but there's obviously a period of time of which um, uh, the, 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 the data storage being, being quite high, um, the retention strategies have become quite vital. Um, data quality is another challenge. Um, with each of the different connectivity types, whether it's through a mobile phone, um, a plug-in dongle or an embedded system, each of those will have different accessible signals. Um, the granularity of the data will be different. The frequency of the collection will be different um, and the data latency appearances will be different. So we need to factor those in. Um, customer privacy is, is, a, um, is one that, that has to be at the forefront. Um, not only do OEMs have to comply with all Australian law, um, particularly under the Australian Privacy Act, um, but we also um, have to consider how um, any uh, vehicle generated data um, is shared with any third party. Uh, we need to be uh, look at our communication and transparency with our guests um, or our customers, um, even more so now um, the concept of digital trust um, is at the forefront of, of people's minds, um, given where we, we've just landed with the, the COVID safe app. And we're seeing the increasing awareness of people's willingness to share personal data. Um, and we're also seeing um, the increased understanding that uh, there needs to be a value exchange for the customer um, for them to provide that willingness to share the information. Uh, and finally, cost. Um, the overall and upfront cost for an OEM to establish a connected um, solution is, is fairly significant. Um, in order for these technologies to, to saturate the Australian marketplace and, and come through, there needs to be positive business models for OEMs to bring this technology to market. Um, so we need to understand um, how the data is going to be used, um, the benefits of that data um, from a commercial and a non-commercial perspective, um, and uh, we need to find positive returns on investments to, to keep the sustainability in this technology. So I might leave it just there and I'll pass on now to Nicholas. Thanks, Ben. Uh, and thanks, good ben afternoon, and all. Ben and Nick. Right, can you hear me? I'm yes, assuming that's a yes. yes. Marcus, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry about that. Thank you. Um, great. Um, so yeah, as the slide says, uh, I'm the manager of the automated vehicle regulation team within the Queensland Department of Transport and Main Roads. Um, and so we're responsible for leading the Queensland government's involvement in national AV regulatory policy reforms. Um, this is a bit broader than just AVs, but we've retained ownership of it, um, both because of its future focus, but also its broad impact across um, TMR, as I'm sure has broad impact across lots of government agencies. I have to apologise, I don't have slides, um, so you're just going to have to listen to me for the next couple of minutes. Um, but I was going to start with a couple of disclaimers myself, more personal than organisational. Um, the first is, as a regulatory boffin, I'm sure I'm the least tech savvy person on this call, um, so be kind. Um, the, the next is, I'm going to be unashamedly biased in looking at the future, rather than necessarily being weighed down by the current state. Um, and that's a future where we see that vehicles will be increasingly connected and automated, um, not without challenge, I'm sure, but, but one that we're really keen to focus on. And the reason I bring that context up is it allows me to be both a little ignorant and a little optimistic um, about what I see as that future. Um, and so, as I said, see past some of those frustrations and, and barriers um, and look to what we need to actually do to lay some of the foundations to, to realise benefits, both as government, but as industry, and also obviously for the consumers as well. So in terms of future opportunities, benefits, and in particular use cases, if we're going to start looking at that level of depth, it's almost impossible to crystal ball gaze exactly what that future might be, what, even indeed what might be possible or needed. Um, and believe me, we've We've tried um, and, and what we've found is we just don't know at the, at the moment. 
Um, and that's okay because we're working under an assumption and I'm happy to be, to be challenged on this, but there will be public value associated with the data that is generated and collected by future vehicles. So that, that's increasingly connected and automated. And there's two factors that lead this assumption. The first is that whilst I agree wholeheartedly with all of the challenges that Ben just identified, most if not all of them will be resolved in time. That is, as these vehicles are progressively deployed, there will be a reduction in the cost associated with them, an increase in the availability, an increase in the quality of the data. It might take some time, but, but we, will, we will slowly start to see that those barriers reduced. The other, and I'm interested in the other panelists' thoughts on this when we open to a discussion, is that I believe that there'll be a, a sort of a dynamic shift, an incentive change between the current state and the future state in terms of the incentive and willingness for data sharing between industry and governments. And it, really at its heart, it's all about the end user. Industry's customers are government's constituents. We serve the same people. And now, but increasingly in the future, we're going to be motivated to ensure that those people get from A to B in an efficient, cost-effective way and safe in a safe way. And this is going to necessitate the sharing of some data in time. So a, a crude example, but one that hopefully most will understand, is that where a vehicle's operation might depend on public infrastructure in the future, and that might be roadside connectivity um, locations, it might be line marking signs, digital mapping, so it could be digital as, both as, as well as physical infrastructure. It might be beneficial both for industry but also the consumer to report on the status of that infrastructure to governments and likewise it might be beneficial or will be beneficial for governments to share the status of that infrastructure back um, and this will ensure that that infrastructure is maintained and that consumer or, or user experience is, is optimised as we go forward. So that's just one example, there's, there's lots more and the NTC's work has identified many. So in terms of that, how we move forward then, our focus really is about building the strategic framework that before we work, before we get to technology, technical solutions. And so that's about understanding collectively between industry and governments, what it is we need to do, why we're trying to do it, how we're going to do it, and formulating that into some sort of framework that's very broad, but that allows this sharing and this, and this engagement and collaboration to happen. Um, that we've been sort of spitballing some principles that might guide the, the, the building of this, a framework like that. Um, and I think that really helps to sort of get us all on the same page. So really high level things like, obviously it has to facilitate collaboration. We'd be looking for mutually beneficial outcomes, of course, and that considers the users, industry and governments collectively. Um, Solutions that leverage and don't dictate market capability. I think that's really important is that it's not about saying we have this specific need and therefore we are looking for some sort of specific technical solution to be uh, added to vehicles or, or the back, back, back office systems that support them. It's about leveraging the opportunities that those systems when deployed um, present. Um, a framework that's agnostic to technology and to business models because there's going to be all different sets of players in here. And then critically, uh, as Ben identified, one that has privacy and, and consumer at its core. Uh, the last thing I'll touch on before I hand back for the general discussion is it, the access in within a framework like that can be considered on a range of terms. And I think this is really important in, in that it's not just a big data grab. Certainly from, from our perspective, it's not about governments just saying, give us all your, give us all your data. We, have, we absolutely understand that there's a commercial value associated with that data and that the viability of, of lots of these types of vehicles depends on that. Um, and so the data framework or sharing framework needs to be flexible. It needs to understand that data can be shared between participants on a range of terms. They might be legislated, mandatory for in some instances. There might be lots of non-commercial terms where information is shared freely between participants. And there's likely to be lots of commercial terms as well where information is, is provided by purchase or exchange. Um, and, and in obviously there'll be some information which is restricted and, and for various commercial reasons is, is not to be shared in, um, for some reason. The, the final point I wanna make, and this is just quickly wearing my very AV biased hat, is that AVs are a little bit different. Um, and the, the scope of this project is such that this probably hasn't come up in the discussion paper that you would have, may have all read. Um, but in the case of AVs, there will be information that necessarily is mandated and, and, and legislated, and, and that's data that governments as well as some other players will require. That's the kind of information like 
who or what was in control of a vehicle at a point in time um, so that we can understand who was liable and what were the circumstances that led to a particular breach in safety or a crash if, if, if crashes occur. Um, so this work's being done in as part of other NTC reforms, but I think it's important just to remember that data is is not done is not managed in silos. We need to think about the types of insights and data that these vehicles will generate, and we need to have a framework that incorporates all of those different types of sharing um, and and f facilitates that sort of collaboration between governments and industry. So that's probably it from me as an intro, Marcus. Great, thanks, uh, Nick, and and thanks everyone for uh, for keeping the time with their with their comments. Um, there's a whole range of different issues that have been raised there that hopefully we can explore in some of the questions from the the audience. Um, one point I would just make as well is that the kind of data framework we're talking about, we do actually have for a, a small segment of the vehicle fleet for, for certain heavy vehicles where data is exchanged between vehicles and and government. Um, but we'll come back to some of the, the elements that, uh, that each of the speakers raised. So we'll move into the discussion phase and, uh, phase and we've got a couple of general questions we'll talk through and, and then take some questions from the audience. So the, the first is around what is vehicle generated data? Uh, and in particular, what is different about this data compared to other sources of data? So we have the question come up sometimes, you know, why can't these things be achieved through mobile phone data, for example? Um, so what's special about uh, the data generated by vehicles um, that might be different to these other sources? So I might hand to, to Ben Wilson, perhaps to start on, on this one and then on to Ben Finkelstein. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess from our perspective, you know, any data generated out of the vehicle is of interest. The, the big change that's occurring um, with the introduction of uh, SIM connected vehicles is that that information can be shared into the cloud very quickly. So there's, you know, thousands of sensors on the vehicle um, that are producing data. Not necessarily every, all of that data is going to be made available um, over the network. Um, but where we're working with uh, our our partners is that we're collecting um, specific data which is useful from our context as I talk about things like road signs and um, and harsh braking. So all of this information um, can be used um, from our perspective to help inform uh, what's actually occurring on the network. And one point I'll make, you, you, you spoke specifically about mobile phone generated data versus connected vehicle data. Um, you know, we've had the opportunity to collect connected vehicle data in Australia for the last few years, and we've been using that in our traffic product. And what we find is that data is a lot less noisy than the mobile phone data that we can collect today. So mobile phone can be used in a, a variety of different contexts. It can be, you know, it can be people walking on the side of the road, they might be riding a bike. Um, and we do a lot of work to filter out the noise within that data. Whereas when we're collecting data directly from the vehicle, we know that the vehicle is traveling between two points, we have a much higher level of confidence. And we've certainly seen an improvement in the quality of our servers um, based off that information. So there's, there's definitely value in getting data directly from the vehicle, um, which reduces the noise that, that you might see on the network. Thanks, thanks, Ben. And we've certainly heard that through our discussions about there's a, a quality versus quantity uh, trade-off when you compare the the two sources of of data. Um, ben Ben Finkelstein, is uh, do you have comments on on this one? Well, I think I think Ben Wilson <clears throat> adequately covered the definition. I think just to add to his comments, I think the, the the benefits of an OEM embedded device is that you'll get quite comprehensive data sets. Um, the, the onboard or the, the OBD devices, um, yes, whether they, they do give a um, some vehicle generated data, but it's usually a limited um, access to data. So the data that is generated is generally um, quite um, high level um, or limited in what's provided. So um, we will see um, once these embedded device um, solutions come to the Australian marketplace, there will be access to comprehensive data sets of vehicle generated data. Great, thanks Ben. And I think that raises an important issue. We haven't really talked about uh, the way you might capture this data and how it would be communicated. And there's obviously a range of different ways that could be done. 
uh, through uh, the mobile phone, uh, the mobile data network, uh, whether that's waiting for 5G or, or earlier, um, or through uh, connected vehicle and connected infrastructure technology, um, so direct short range communication. But the, the kind of principles and, and, and challenges that we're, we're talking about uh, are probably the, uh, similar across some of these different ways you could send across that data. Yeah, right. I, I um, think it's important. Oh, sorry, I was just going to, just one comment, Marcus, just to sort of say that when we do talk about this connected vehicle, vehicle generated data, where we mainly refer to telematics data um, rather than, um, and Nicholas mentioned earlier, where we started to talk about cooperative intelligence transport systems. Um, the focus, um, particularly for this forum and, and the discussion paper, was um, namely that connected vehicle telematics data. Yeah. That's that's right. Now, I guess that's uh, was partly with a view to you know what's out there at the moment and what are the the short to medium term op opportunities. Yeah, recognising that there may be uh, uh, different technologies that emerge in, in future. All right, uh, we'll jump on to the next uh, uh, topic, which I think is a really interesting one about uh, benefits. So, um, what are some of the benefits that we're actually seeing today um, from vehicle generated data? What are the benefits that we might start to see in, in future? Um, how can the drivers and the, and the public actually benefit from this kind of data? And, and what are the use cases where vehicle generated data is, is, is more likely to pr provide these benefits? Um, so I might um, go to uh, Ben Wilson again to start with to talk about you know, what are some of the benefits today and, and then looking ahead to the future. And you've touched on that a little bit in your presentation. Uh, and then go to uh, to to Ben Finkelstein and, and to to Nick Mackay. Uh, so Ben Wilson, do you want to kick off? Yeah, I, I guess um, from our perspective, what we're seeing is um, some of the public safety uh, areas that can be addressed by having real time um, low latency information being shared uh, with a variety of different customers, whether that be the, the driver of the vehicle to understand that there might be some harsh braking occurring um, around the corner from them and that they need to be prepared for a stop, or it might be um, the information being shared about an accident to um, road safety services so that they can deploy ambulance or, or police to a scene. Um, so really it's it's about providing low latency um, information back to a variety of users so that they can um, take advantage of that type of information. And that's, that's where we see that. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Ben. Uh, I'll uh, throw over to, to Ben Finkelstein. What what are the key benefits that you're looking for 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 your customers um, uh, from this kind of technology and this kind of data? So I think it, it's twofold. So I think today globally OEMs are using vehicle generated data to enhance products and services to its customers. So some examples would be we're seeing increased driver safety with introductions of SOS and automatic crash notification services. We're seeing uh, enhanced mapping that provides more enriched maps and content. Um, we're seeing connected roadside assistance where roadside providers are able to gain a better understanding of a vehicle's location and help the driver get back on the road more quickly. Um, and secondly, uh, OEMs are using that vehicle generated data to provide a more personalized and tailored service to their customers. So we're seeing new insurance uh, uses based insurances where um, products are based on how drivers um, as they drive or how they drive. Um, and we're also seeing improved infotainment where we're seeing multimedia services and content that is more suggestive and personalised. So suggesting places of interest, parking, traffic, routing preferences. So um, they're probably the, the two main areas where we're seeing current benefits to um, to customers. Yeah, thanks Ben. And, and uh, are there benefits you would see that will start to emerge over time in the future or, or are they really just extensions of those current benefits? I think they will be extensions of those uh, current benefits. So there'll be, further um, new services, um, new product offerings um, that will benefit um, the, the customer's journey, um, will make them more safer um, and provide an overall um, better experience and engagement between um, the OEM um, and the driver users of those vehicles. Great, thanks Ben. 
And uh, Nick, from a, a, a road agency perspective, you know, what are the benefits that you would, would see today in greater access to this data? And, and again, what are the benefits you would see uh, in, into the future? Thanks, Marcus. Uh, I, look, I probably take the same, similar um, approach to the other two in terms of um, existing benefits. My, as I said in my introduction, my focus really is on the, on that future. Um, and I think that as we get a greater penetration of connected vehicles across the net network, there's, there's lots of really exciting benefits that could be realised. Um, so we've, we've you know, already heard about real-time safety, um, there'll be, there'll be thing, uh, benefits to, to road and, uh, operations, things like managing traffic congestion. Uh, integrating um, public transport and mobility as a service um, across the network, particularly for vehicles that offer those services um, into the future. Um, I touched on infrastructure maintenance, both both physical and, and uh, digital already, um, and, and um, maximising the benefit of some of the investments we make, both in new infrastructure, but also in, in um, uh, improving existing infrastructure for safety reasons. So I think there's lots of benefits, but I think if we focus on that end user, uh, really the benefits are getting somewhere safer, faster, more efficiently, more comfortably. Um, and, and I think that partnership between industry and government achieves that if, if we can pass data across in the right way. I'll probably just right, add thanks. to that in, in that partnership area um, between industry and government, it's going to be more and more important for uh, industry and government to work together on these type of things because there's going to be uh, information required by industry um, to be able to inform the vehicles and uh, to provide information about that. Today we work with road authorities to collect road closure information and these type of things and into the future um, we'd be looking to get more integrated with um, any network changes that they make so that we can uh, you know, efficiently inform the consumers about what's actually occurring on the road network so they can make better decisions about what's going on. Great, thanks, Ben. And that's, uh, I think, a nice segue into the the next um, topic. And we'll uh, we'll pause after this one and open it up to questions from the audience. So, um, wanted to touch on on barriers and and perhaps uh, Ben Wilson, I'll come back to you about what the barriers might be to to those sorts of partnerships and 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 building on those in the future. Uh, and I'm conscious uh, that a couple of, of the speakers have already touched on the the, the barriers and, and challenges. In, in particular, uh, Ben Finkelstein. And I'd like to give you an opportunity, Ben, to respond to the uh, the uh, idea from Nick that those barriers might reduce over over time uh, naturally, and, and, and whether you agree with that. Uh, but for all of these opportunities, you know, we need to look at what the barriers are to, to realising them, and and what can industry and governments do to overcome those challenges. So um, I might perhaps start with with Ben Finkelstein, uh, uh, given you've touched on the the barriers earlier. Uh, you know what. Do industry and governments need to do, and 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 do you agree with Nick that these barriers will will naturally reduce over time? Thanks, Marcus. And no, I, I do agree with Nicholas that you know, with with time and with a collaborated collaborated approach between government and industry, that we can work through these barriers and challenges. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, the the connected vehicle technology within the Australian marketplace is still at its infancy stage with only you know, less than 1% of vehicles connected. So um, we are all on this journey together and I think with the right um, voluntary framework in place to, to have the right discussions, we can, we can look to break down and work through these barriers and challenge um, to benefit all. Um, we're all. We're all working in this space because we have a passion for it. We see that there's, a, there's an opportunity to improve um, road safety and driving experiences um, so I think uh, with that collaboration, uh, we can work through these um, across years to come. Great, thanks, uh, Ben. And, and Ben, from your perspective, you know, what's what's the the greatest barrier? Is it uh, is it cost? Uh, is it some of the privacy issues that you, that you talked about? What what do you think is the most significant one? Uh, they're all significant. Cost does play um, a significant part in it. Um, given the, uh, the upfront um, investment that OEMs have to make to bring these to market, uh, there has to be um, a return on investment to keep these technologies viable across future vehicles. Um, having said that though, customer privacy um, and this notion now of digital trust um, has to be at the forefront of everybody's mind. Um, uh, just because um, vehicle data may be available 
um, we need to make sure that a customer understands what data is being collected, how that data is being shared, and we have to um, constantly communicate with our customers to ensure that we maintain that, that digital trust. Uh, Toyota Australia is one of the, the most reputable brands in Australia, and, and we need to make sure that we, we keep that trust through the data governance that, that we, um, we put in place for ourselves um, for connected vehicle data. Um, and then the more technical side, the data quality and the, and the availability of data to Nick's earlier comments, um, that, that will resolve itself once we see that saturation or if we see that saturation um, develop across the Australian marketplace. Great, thanks, Ben. Uh, I might throw to Nick Mackay then about you know what do you see as the the key barriers and and challenges from a from a government perspective, and, and what do you think industry and government can do to overcome those? Yeah, thanks, Marcus. Uh, I, I think um, one of, if not the biggest barrier, is is or opportunity and barrier is formula formalising exactly what we're doing now. This this engagement between government and industry into some sort of framework, as I discussed earlier. I think the NTC should uh, deserve some credit for the way they've approached this project in the sense that it's been a really good collaborative journey um, across uh, a number of different workshops where government and industry have sat in the same room, um, heard each other's perspectives and, 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 what, and what we're trying to achieve. And I think in an informal sense, it's been great. I think the, 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 the challenge now is how do we formalize that? How do we go from, from this to, to a sort of embedding that as the status quo and, and so that, Governments both understand the opportunities that, that these, these new technologies are presenting and, and where there might be uh, opportunities for sharing and, and, and the delivering of, of value, but also understand the commercial opportunities that, that might be available um, that, that they might be interested in as well. Um, but then equally industry understands some of the challenges and problems that government are increasingly having and whether or not vehicle generated data is one way of solving that. Um, I think to, to one of the points made earlier in this in this web, um, webinar, vehicle generated data won't be the answer of the panacea to everything. And so we, you know, within that framework, we need to have the conversations about is this data of value for this particular use? Is another and are, or are there other better ways of, of, of gaining those same insights? So um, yeah, I think that relationship building, formalizing that, and, and understanding what we're trying to achieve and how we're going to do it um, is really kind of the, the, the next big thing that we need to do. Great, thanks, Nick. Uh, and uh, Ben Wilson, you, you talked about partnerships between industry and government. What, what do you see as the key challenges there and, and, and what can industry and governments do to, to overcome those? Uh, I think there's probably a, you know, quite a few issues uh, from that perspective, but probably the, the key thing is it's really about cooperation between you know from ourselves and the way that we work with um, with government to collect data from them to provide them with some guidance in regard to the type of data that's required um, so that we can make um, relevant updates to our information to ensure that we can communicate that um, across a broad section of the community probably the other point that i'd touch on um, going back to the, to the earlier point was at a local level there's always a challenge associated with um, the rollout of, of technology into the Australian market. Um, we tend to lag a little bit behind um, European and North America markets because of the size of the market here. And that's one of the, uh, the, you know, the points of um, you know, a, a challenge from the, from the local industry is that we, you know, generally a technology taker, not a technology leader in that perspective. And um, that we have a community full of early adopters. Um, yeah, you know, we need to be pushing uh, the, the OEMs to ensure that they're, they're rolling this technology out um, you know, as, soon as, as soon as possible. But obviously they've got their business cases that they need to um, justify for when they roll out this type of technology. Yep, great, thanks Ben. All right, I'll um, just open it up to, to questions. Um, Stacey, can I, I check with you whether we've got some uh, questions and comments coming through? We certainly do. They range from the very broad to the very specific. Um, one of the, the key um, issues identified, and you've touched on this, is with regards to um, privacy. Uh, I, I asked, you've already talked about the, the vital importance of that um, and that digital integ integrity to get to customers to um, opt in. Um, and COVID safe has proven that there is a willingness for the public good to share this data. I'd ask, um, I think, from an industry and regulator perspective, do you think that the current legislation and privacy principles um, broadly are enough to manage in vehicle data collection? 
It's a it's a very good question. Uh, I might um, perhaps throw to Ben Finkelstein first on this from a, a Toyota perspective. Um, whether you uh, uh, you you think the the, the current uh, schemes are, are adequate, or, or are there are there issues that need to be addressed? Yeah, look, it's it's a question um, that that I would um, like to defer to my to my legal counsel, but I think the sure. the Privacy Act. Um, lays the foundation um, for what needs to be established for data privacy frameworks. I think each each OEM will need to independently formulate uh, their own customer data privacy positions and arrangements, um, and ensure um, that um, that vehicle generated data falls um, within their individual uh, privacy notices, um, and it's. Um, will also be in their responsibility to make sure that they communicate these changes with their customers um, to again come back to that concept of digital trust. That's great. One of the very specific. Are you, Marcus? Sorry, Stacey. I'll just add from it. Uh, from from an NTC perspective, you know, we've done some work on these issues in in the past, and and one of the challenges is Australia, is we do have different schemes, uh, uh, a scheme under Commonwealth legislation for corporations and covering Commonwealth agencies, and then a variety of state-based schemes that that cover state uh, agencies and their use of data. So um, that does just create some complexity uh, in this space as well. Yeah, well, I might just back to you, Stacey. Uh, Marcus, that uh, oh, yeah, sorry. we deal with a, a number of different automotive uh, companies around the world, and um, we generally work to the, the highest level of privacy standard um, globally. So it's important from an Australian perspective that um, we understand that these are global companies and that we're going to be working across international standards that we need to work with. And we need to understand how they're going to fall under the under umbrella of international standards. But generally, as as Ben mentioned. Um, these companies have, uh, you know, they, they take pride in their uh, organisation's uh, reputation and the trust that they have with consumers. So they're very conservative in the way they go about handling privacy issues. And we know that all the data that we get is then on the mice before it's delivered to us. So there's no way that we could ever, um, from the data that we collect, ever uh, identify it back to a single person. Okay. Thanks, Ben. So we just add we do hear quickly. Uh, Sure, go, Nick. I was just going to say quickly, Marcus, um, I think the last point that Ben made is really relevant around just considering when we're talking about privacy, where personal information or sensitive information is actually required. In lots of the, the use cases and in delivering lots of the benefits we've discussed today, you probably don't actually need uh, data that it identifies an individual and in, insight level de-identified data is, is probably sufficient. Um, that just to Stacey's original question in terms of the appropriateness of the existing privacy frameworks, um, broadly they're probably okay, but where they fall down is where governments might need information. So that, that sort of mandatory category I spoke about in my introduction. Um, and that's where we will need additional access provisions. Um, and those provisions will need to be um, weighed up against privacy implications and, and have appropriate protections built into them so that so that the privacy framework expands as the, as the technology does and the, the, the task does. Yeah. Thanks Nick. All right, uh, back to you Stacey. Um, you mentioned the cross-border issues, um, Marcus, and the complexity as this age old question when we're talking about these changes. Is there any thought to the organisation that might be responsible for harmonising data types of types of data collection and management um, across the, the country and in, internationally? Uh, there certainly has been some thought about that. I, I don't think there's any uh, clear conclusions at, at this stage and I'll, I'll open it up for others. But uh, we understand there's a lot of debate in Europe about the, the model and uh, is the data being generated from the vehicle being sent directly to, to government? Is it being sent to uh, an, an, a cloud controlled by an automotive manufacturer uh, or to a third party uh, provider like a, a, a here or other data aggregators or some kind of mix of, of the above? So um, that all of that will have um, significant implications for, for privacy and, and for security and, and, and those sorts of issues. Uh, but uh, I, I guess at this stage it's an an issue we're aware of, but uh, there's there's no kind of conclusions at, at this point. Um, but I'll open it up. Uh, others, uh, perhaps uh, Ben Wilson, do you want to talk to that point? Uh, it's probably a difficult one to, to talk to any great detail, um, 
as Nicholas mentioned before, there's there's differences on the on the type of information that you're collecting and what the end use case that you're trying to achieve. From from our perspective, we really don't have a requirement to have any private data collected. We're really in the business of aggregating data together um, and then providing insights out of that data. Um, but you know, as I mentioned before, we're working with global companies that are trying to deliver um, a single solution across the multiple markets um, as best they can to keep their costs down. So uh, there's the the more that that um, that those regulations are in line, um, it will make it easier as an industry and easier for Australia to fall in line with um, what's occurring at a global level. Right. Thanks, Ben. Uh, ben Finkelstein or, or Nick McKay, do you have comments on that question? Ben, no? Nope. All right. Uh, oh, sorry, Nick, I was waiting for you. <laughs> um, right, Nick, do you want to jump in? I'm just not specifically. Yep. All right, thanks, uh, Ben. Uh, no, I think it's been adequately covered by, by Ben Wilson. Great, thank you. All right, um, Stacey, I'll go back to you. Yeah, there's reference to the European Data Task Force um, and whether you're looking to that. Um, I know that you, after the consultations you've been running, um, I thought I'd ask you, Marcus, to, to reference what you're working with regards to the European work. Sure. So. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're looking at this as a potential model and uh, as uh, Ben Wilson and others have mentioned, there's a, a strong desire from industry to follow um, international standards and international models that are that are being developed. Um, it's certainly not a, a final model at this stage, it's, a, it's more of a proof of, of concept, uh, but it's an, an interesting one for us to track here in Australia as to how uh, automotive manufacturers could agree to, through a memorandum of understanding, to share information on a, a reciprocal basis with, with governments, so they do get uh, data back uh, in return, uh, and how that, that model might work and, and the kinds of use cases that they're focused on. So they've got a short list of, of eight use cases that they are working through, which is things like when the electronic stability control is, uh, is triggered in a vehicle, that that information and the location of it uh, is communicated across, because that may indicate a spillage or ice on the road or, or, or some of these kind of Kind of issues uh, that could be a, a safety risk. Uh, so you know we're, we're not saying we have to follow that that model, um, but it's an interesting one for Australia to look at, given we generally follow European standards uh, with our vehicles. Um, but are, are there any other comments on that uh, that European uh, model? Perhaps um, uh, Ben Ben Wilson from from you. Um, yeah, that's one that he's been uh, working with uh, some of the OEMs in the European market and I've been speaking to my European colleagues about the, the role that we play there, but fundamentally the role is as an aggregator um, to collect data and you know, act as a neutral server um, where the data can be accessed by government parties and, and therefore protect the privacy of of the of the uh, vehicles involved and ensure that um, it's only being released um, as per requirement. Um, there's certainly um, different models uh, are going to emerge um, from from our perspective. We're interested to understand and work with government on the best way that we can um, play you know, an important role within that and ensure that we're, we're meeting those requirements. Great, thanks, Ben. Uh, Stacey, are there, are there other questions you've got there or comments? There are. Nick, if you don't mind, I've got one specifically for you. As uh, regulation um, often. Uh, is this the question with regards to given that the state transport agencies have both the planning and regulatory power, is that lack of separation perhaps a barrier to data sharing? Uh, so I'm, I'm interpreting this as a concern that uh, data uh, gathered for one purpose, such as planning, might be used for another purpose, such as compliance and enforcement. So um, if, if that's what the, the issue is, then you know, I, I think that is a, a key one that it needs to be clear uh, when any uh, data is gathered, the, the purpose uh, for which it's being used. I think as, as Nick alluded to earlier, there's probably a lot of opportunities there where you don't actually need um, to identify individuals and have personal information. Um, so that does help uh, alleviate some of those, those concerns. Um, but uh, uh, Nick, is there anything you, you would add to that uh, topic? 
the only thing I'd add as a, as a regulatory boffin is, is that the legislation will, will where, where information is needed that is identifying will provide and will need to provide for the exact terms in which it can be used and for, and for what purposes. So um, this is the way our privacy framework is, is structured is it allows us to collect information for a variety of reasons and typically for the primary for the, for, a, for a, a sole purpose. So um, yeah, I think that we will need to work through those issues in time. There'll be lots of, of, of great things that we can do that don't, doesn't re don't require um, personal information. But as I said to um, before, particularly in relation to automated vehicles where there's some liability issues, we will need some. We will need personal information, and there will be appropriate protections to ensure that's used as per its intent. Okay. I think something that comes right, up guys. a lot. Is... Sorry, right. I was Sorry, just thinking if I could add to. Could, could I just add one comment uh, to to Nicholas and Marcus's comments um, earlier around um, the identified data? I think it's also worth noting. From an OEM perspective, um, within their data privacy positions and arrangements, um, regardless of whether the vehicle generated data is is personally identifiable information or de-identified aggregated data, there may be positions where an OEM will choose to take a stance above and beyond what's required under Australian law. Um, so, for example, um, uh, under the Australian Privacy Act. Um, for um, for primary purpose, we must notify the customer um, of what the intended use of that information is. For any secondary purpose, um, we need to attain consent. Um, uh, an OEM may choose to follow that um, that th that regulation by the law, or it may choose to take a stance above and beyond that, where it, it will look to attain consent from its customer for any type of data, regardless of whether it's identifiable or not. So I think. We just need to make sure that we set expectations um, early in these discussion points that that this that there is a piece of customer privacy that that may sit above the regulatory stance required. Great, thanks for that, Ben. Uh, sorry, Stacey, you were jumping in there as well. I was, but I've just noticed we've only got a few minutes left, and I think there's yep. some calls to action that you might want to direct people to to um, engage with your consultations. So, might um, hand over to you to wrap that up, and I'll, I'll take a bite of one. Great, thanks, Stacey. Um, so thanks again to ITS Australia and to the to the panel, uh, and also all of you for uh, attending and and for your your questions, um, which were all very pertinent uh, ones to raise. So um, it's a very broad and challenging topic to try and cover in an hour, but hopefully gives you a flavour of of some of the issues that we're trying to deal with. Um, we would really appreciate uh, feedback uh, through our consultation process, either um, directly through uh, to the NTC, um, to myself, um, or uh, uh, through a, a formal submission. Um, and we're keen to continue the, the conversation because we see this as the start of a process um, rather than one where we're going to be able to solve all, the, all of the issues between now and November. Um, so please do uh, continue to contribute to the, the conversation um, so that as a country we can gain the benefits um, of this kind of data and technology as it comes to the market uh, and improve the road safety uh, uh, congestion and other outcomes for our road transport system. Um, so thank you again to, to everyone for participating today um, and uh, do please feel free to, to reach out and, and get in touch. Um, and uh, 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 back to you, Stacey, if there's anything final you want to mention. Thanks. Well, we do have a lot of questions that I'll send across to you. And um, if you could take them on notice, that would be great, or at least feed them into your consultation process. Um, next week, we'll uh, have Minister Bailey coming to give us an update on what's happening in Queensland. Uh, so hopefully you'll be able to join us. And also Susan Harris, our CEO, will be updating um, us on what's happening um, in ITS Australia and globally. I think a lot of you will have seen that the understandably the ITS World Congress has been cancelled in LA. Um, so we'll have a chat about what that means for us and what we can do with all of the amazing material that we've all put together and, and submitted that now we won't be able to get to present in LA. Um, so which is not great but completely understandable. Um, so I hope everyone's well and safe as expected and hopefully see you next week. Okay. Bye everyone. Thanks.